It is my pleasure to represent the uh, United States here. It's uh, always fun to come to this part of the world. For example, the level of expertise that has been presented here today, you guys need to be congratulated for all the hard work that's gone into the science that you're developing. I have had the opportunity to visit some farms in this part of the world, and I see levels of production approaching what we're doing in the United States. You're fast reducing the gap between where I observed two years ago and where some of your farms are at today. Again, you need to be congratulated on all this hard work. <clears throat> As a private practitioner, one of the major opportunities that I get placed into is discovery. Basically, questions that are being asked by owners, by farm staff, they want to know why something is happening. So I get to do all the discovery part. That's necropsies, that's diagnostics, that's learning how to use some of the tests, the newer tests that are coming down the pike. Well, both of these viruses that we've heard about today, PERS and circle virus, have allowed us to do a lot of discovery and ask a lot of tough questions. And then the next step is to develop those risk factors that's associated. And you, you're constantly coming back to the management issues, and that includes environment. It includes how we ventilate these barns, how we set some of the things, what we're feeding these animals. We had a major change in the United States last year when corn went to $7 a bushel. Never seen that before. And all of a sudden, the profitability was dropping, so we started to feed a byproduct from ethanol. And then we had some other discoveries that we needed to learn and, to, uh, and, and how that was affecting the animals. I, I digress just a little bit, only because I wanted to give you a flavor of what I do nearly every day. Well, if we want to start with PCVAD, we've seen some of these pictures before. Basically, what appeared to be a weight loss in these animals, or a wasting, the PMWS, this particular farm presented with only circle virus in the intestinal tract of these pigs. One of the things that uh, it's really tough to do with some clients is to go in and euthanize a pig that seems to be fairly robust. But early in the disease process, we need to understand all the different pathogens that are present. And in this particular flow, when, and we had about a half a dozen of these, the only thing that we could find causing the diarrhea was circle virus. No salmonella, no brachiospira, uh, no ileitis in those particular flows. Pigs with this type of PDNS, we've heard several times, they don't live very long. And it's amazing how clinical signs are different between flows. You know, we've had experiences where pigs coming out of a sow unit go into a wean to finish flow, and others go into a traditional nursery and then move to the finisher. In the wean to finish flow, the mortality rates were not nearly as high as in the traditional nursery. And so you see these kind of differences, and sometimes we've got to look through the trees to find out exactly what the target is. Again, very typical in large kidneys. It's amazing how those pigs can live as long as they do and, and the tannish coloration that will occur. The pulmonary edema, the interlobular edema, that's a very virus looking lung. This particular lung, when I graduated from veterinary school 30 years ago, that was easy to diagnose. We called that mycoplasma or enzootic pneumonia. This lung, the only pathogen that we could find, major pathogen that we could find, was circle virus. There was also some bacterial components, as you can see with the fibrin, but it was consistent in that particular flow. So you get this variation from one farm to the next farm. And of course, the enlarged lymph nodes were outstanding. Where have we been? 
it is so much, it, it is more fun today to go out to some of these farms and see the production levels because we have eliminated a big economic concern. We've talked a little bit today and we've touched on economics, but when you're in an all-in, all-out flow, and that can be by room and that can be by building, that room or that building has to be completely emptied before you can put more pigs into it. So what do you do with these lightweight pigs? There's a lot of names for them. We call them calls, we call them lightweights, uh, but they're problems because we cannot sell them as a full market value pig. And so that's a big area of the economics of, of disease. And we're gonna touch on it a little bit. But as you can see, after we started to vaccinate, we're right back down to where we were prior. The same with mortality. Although in these three examples, the levels of mortality were not high, but I selected these three farms because they're not complicated with mycoplasma or PERS. It is strictly related to circle virus as the primary pathogen and then some secondary bacterial components. And again, we're back to where we were before. I'm going to use this study on a site to illustrate uh, what one word describes, and that word is serendipity. Serendipity means where you do something and you're pleasantly surprised about some of the outcome. There's some, this is part of that discovery that I was talking about. This site has got four finishing barns. Each barn holds less than 900 pigs. Roughly 885 pigs is what they put in a barn. They're all barrows and each barn is one pin. So if you can think through this design, so we have one pin per barn, so we have plenty of opportunity for pigs to expose each other. And each barn is all in, all out, but the site is not all in, all out. <clears throat> this, is, this farm experienced some of the worst PCVAD situations that in my practice. That's why I wanted to use it as an example. The average uh, finishing mortality prior to PCVAD was two to three percent, and it went to eight percent. Mortality is the other major component of the economic loss experienced by producers with disease. So we're going to compare 20 barns that were vaccinated, roughly 16,000 pigs, versus 12 barns that were not vaccinated. So this is a before and after uh, design, study design. And the unit, of course, is the barn. The results for this is where some of the serendipity starts to, to unfold for us. Yes, on mortality and calls, definitely we had a nice improvement and everybody seemed to be happy. But as I looked at the records more closely, we started to discover that the pigs were leaner going to market. And so there's, there's the discovery part, and then you start to try to understand what is going on. So then we started to look at average daily feed intake. Now all of these records are on closeout. So the pigs are weighing approximately 60 pounds, and they're going to market approximately 100 and 265 to 275 pounds. And so we're putting 200 pounds of gain plus on each individual. And this 1% improvement in percent lean meat added to the returns on investment that this producer experienced. Those returns are in the paper in the, in the proceedings. But as you can see, not every unit will respond the same. In this case, we had a nice little increase in average daily gain, but feed efficiency was not necessarily improved, even though every animal was eating a bit more feed every day. Several of the speakers have used this type of charting. This is uh, statistical process control charting. I really like how we can look at uh, data points over time 
with this method, but just as a review, this is the mean for the data points on, in this box. And then we look at three standard deviations on either side of the mean. Now the first standard de deviation line has been taken out and also the second. So this represents basically a six sigma look to this. And then if you do a process change, in this case vaccination, you have to recalculate the data points and you find that pigs after we vaccinated them become more consistent. Not only was there an improvement, but they became more consistent, more reliable. In this case, in feed efficiency, average daily gain, we see a nice little improvement. And again, a bit more consistency. Percent lean meat, this was, the, this was the surprise factor. This was the wow factor that we observed in this particular flow. Now, it does not occur in every flow. Personally, as a practitioner, I think there's a bit of difference in the timing of exposure to the virus and, uh, and how these pigs respond. This is the average daily feed intake graph. The groups below the mean were definitely the ones pulling down the average. And so we just brought that bottom part up. So we had less pigs that were sick, more pigs that were eating every day like they should. So you get a nice response to the genetic package that the producer has purchased. So in conclusion to this study design, sure, we've seen the same thing that we've heard all day long. Improved mortality rates, improved performance, but also the carcass parameters became better. I am told that over 90% of the pigs in the United States are now vaccinated with circle virus vaccine. That's amazing. We are currently in the 17th month of, of um, lack of profitability for producers. And one of the issues, of course, is the fact that we're producing so many pigs. Circle virus vaccine has been blamed for that. But I thought, I think it was coming anyway because we were looking at efficiency, our inputs were going up, we have to produce more pounds of pork per sow in, in our units. Let's take a step in a little different direction. This was this, the first time that I was exposed to what I'm going to call mild circle virus infection was by a, a small client. I go to his farm once a year. 180 sows, fair to finish. Small in standards of the United States, but still a very key client. <clears throat> and I told him the other day when I was there, he's one of the young producers that's a rising star in my practice because he's thinking about what his animals are telling him. He's observing and he's asking me questions. He's asking his team of advisors questions. He showed me back in 2007 where he started to use vaccine on his flow. He did not have PCVAD. But he showed me a group that was not vaccinated and right behind that a group that was vaccinated. That changed immediately as a veterinarian, it changed my outlook and I started to look at mild infection with circle virus. What could we accomplish? And I had a lot of questions asked to me by producers that were not experiencing PCVAD, but they were saying, what should I observe if I use this vaccine? And so I'd like to show you some of the results. This particular farm was a total depopulation, repopulation. He had a multitude of diseases, PERS was one of them, APP was another. And so economics was such, he decided to completely depop that site. It's a single site farm. It is a thousand sows. And so the disease parameters are always a little different on these single sites. <clears throat> As you can see, he was very pleased with his mortality rates but as I would walk through his unit, there would be some pigs that I would wonder about and say, hey, let's take a necropsy one of these or a couple of these. Ah, he said, no, nah, we don't need to do it. We're doing great. Finally, he let me do some diagnostics and we discovered what I thought we would and that was we had some circle virus involved 
in some of the groups, more so than the others. Again, we were all pleasantly surprised. This is the process change. This is where vaccination started. And again, just a, a drop in mortality rate on the average, but so, more, so much more consistent in his production. In this particular graph, the first standard and second standard deviation lines are not removed. But again, this is that six sigma look and graphing that we do so much of today. All of you guys can do the same thing. You can buy add-on programs to Excel. That's what I did. And they're, it's, it's really fairly easy if I can do it. So I'd like to change gears just a minute and make a few comments about PERS in the United States. You've heard from several today about PERS. Yes, PERS continues to be our number one disease now that we have vaccinated for circovirus. We see a new severe strain about every four or five years. And I don't know, I'm not saying that as a prediction here in this part of the world, but that is what we experience. And so we still see, and we're talking about the severe production losses. Uh, we're looking at area control programs today, at least in the talking stage, and seeing what we might be able to do if we can bring producers together. But for me, I like to look and monitor abort abortion rates on farms. And I'm going to show you the style that I used to use, and then I'm going to move to a style that I'm using today. This is the type of graph that I used to look at, or used to construct for clients. We, this is a uh, fairly large herd, even in United States standards. It's a 5,600 sal unit. It's feral to wean, so wean pigs leave this site. One thing unique about this particular farm, they have their gilt development uh, building pretty close to the, to the sow farm. So I called this an abortion timeline. This farm was naive to PERS at the beginning of 2008. And then we had a little blip on abortions. And my next slide will go through what we consider as normal for the different seasons of the year. We had a, a bit of an abortion storm go through there in uh, April of 08. And we diagnosed an American strain PERS that's usually considered fairly uh, severe um, in early May. Now there's a point here I'd like to, to make is in these larger populations, if you just perform herd closure, you might see this lingering abortion business. Dr. Marika talked to us about subpopulations. That's what's going on as that virus moves through the uh, population here, it's finding sows that, that were still naive. This is not a stable situation. And then we got a European strain PERS that caused us very severe uh, abortion rates for a short period of time in there. If you look at large enough databases, you will, you will determine probably something like what we have. This is the level that we usually look for when we base the number of aborts per week per thousand sows. So as the farms have gotten bigger, we're now looking at things a little differently. So we're saying, okay, what happens on a per thousand sow basis? This way I can compare a 3,200 sow farm to a 5,600 sow farm more easily. We have basically two seasons when it comes to aborts. We have the low season and then we have the seasonal anesthetists or seasonal reproductive problems that, we, that everybody has read about. And the abortion rates usually increase during that high season. Back to this 5,600 sow farm. We were just a tad high on aborts prior to the outbreak, May the 8th. And so we doubled in abortion rates on a per thousand basis per week. And then we really skyrocketed when we had the second isolate get in. This immediately tells you a couple of things. One, we have area spread or our external biosecurity programs are lacking. We may have brought this in with, with a truckload or whatever. Um, 
and the guilt in the guilt developer may have influenced this uh, this herd status a bit but the farm system had only used herd closure as their tool to control in other outbreaks that they'd had this is the only farm they have in the state of Indiana most of their farms are farther east and they have not experienced a lot of PERS this is the way we're graphing aborts today and I like this method better than my previous method as you can see very quickly on a weekly basis we were we were okay doing fine somewhere in here we had the PERS virus enter we didn't diagnose it until May there was a little lag phase uh, they did not see that the number of aborts had jumped that that high and then you can find that hey we're still not stable so one of the things that we've talked about at this farm is as we've moved forward was to increase the number of piglets that they are monitoring on a on a monthly basis and so we're looking at what if we go from 30 pigs to 60 pigs and we pool five samples into one normally with 30 well, what if we pool 10 samples into one now and keep the cost relatively the same so that's part of that discovery method that I was talking about earlier so the take-home message is prevention and control those are still the two main things that we have to do in this industry um, we've heard a lot of different areas about that but external biosecurity is probably the biggest area that we are looking at. Before I go on, I want to mention one other thing. Dr. Mike Murtal clearly showed that there's an age difference in how these animals respond to PERS. Well, there's a route difference as well. Orally, it takes a lot more virus to infect an animal than if it gets through the skin, like a needle, or pigs post-weaning in the nursery. Just consider that as, as a method in your understanding of ep epidemiology with PERS virus. Managing PERS is very complex. There's no easy answer, but we've been eliminating PERS from sites for the last 10 years. My first case was, uh, we started it in 97, and I think we completed it somewhere in 99 or 2000. So it can be done. Now, should it be done? That's a question you need to work with with producers. But find the right tools. What we've talked about all day long is tools. Vaccine's a tool, antibiotics a tool, management's a tool. Understand how to implement those in each and every farm and, and you'll be pleasantly pleased with the performance that you'll receive. I want to leave you with one idea. The bee is, is at the majority and he's very happy. What about the opportunities that he's missing? Continue to look for other opportunities. They're there. These animals will show us and help us understand things if we just look and listen to the animals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. The floor is now open for questions. Tom, um, what would, do, do you have a uh, standard diagnostic protocol when you're looking at uh, mild or subclinical cases of PCBAD? I mean, you, you, you can't see the clinical signs. Do you have any diagnostic tests that you could uh, you know, use? We still use the, um, the ELISA or the PCR or both. Uh, to help us understand where exposure is occurring, mm -hmm. things like that. But definitely we have tissue submissions to find out, answer the question on virus loading. Okay. The amount of virus in these animals is the key, and I think that's why the vaccine has performed so consistently and so well. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. There's one there. Thank you. Uh, question: uh, uh, Circovirus vaccination program in the farm that has a big problem with PRS. 
Uh, do we need to vaccinate the, the, soul, the South as well? Thank you. The question is on circovirus vaccine and vaccinating in sows. Uh, the question is, a particular farm has a concurrent problem with PERS as well. So what would be your recommendation? We have not needed to vaccinate that many sow herds with circovirus. Uh, I, I agree with several of the other speakers. I think it's reproductively, it's not as common. So we're still vaccinating pigs. And then PERS is a total separate issue. For me as a practitioner, we line out the vaccine program for circovirus. Then we look at the PERS situation try to understand where exposure is occurring. I need to vaccinate three to four weeks prior to that. And so yes, vaccinating sows is to stabilize that sow herd to be able to wean a negative pig. I think one of the, one of the confusion points, and maybe it's part of our growth and education in the United States and North America with this vaccine is, look at the sow herd differently when, when it comes to PERS than to grow finished pigs. Dr. John Waddell's research with uh, Nebraska pork producers where he vaccinated, what was it, 16,000 pigs. It was a very large number of pigs. Even though some of those pigs were already infected with PERS, he improved, he showed, and we've seen some of those slides today, how performance improved. Deal with that differently than you're going to deal with the sow herd. Okay, any more questions? Okay. Tom, do you, do you have any um, experiences or have you seen cases where in, in a single farm with PCVD, uh, the, the peak of the viral load changes, you know, from young animals to older animals within the same farm? Yeah, we've seen that within uh, flows. Um, I don't quite understand why that virus, uh, the, the point of exposure will change over time a little bit. Uh, it was very common for us to see the six, seven week exposure. We could graft those, those pigs, bleed the same pigs over every week for a while. By nine, nine weeks of age, we had 100% viremic. And we would see the clinical signs then roughly 12, 14 weeks of age. And then after a period of time, and this was before vaccine, it would move to a little older pig. So it, there's something there that we don't totally understand. I mean, we would try to imp implement all the management aspects. Maybe we changed it a little bit with that. I'm not really sure. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Tom Gillespie.